whenever you're ready. All right. This is July 1st, 2010. We're doing an interview for the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project, and we're talking today with Mr. Jim Hodges of Alton, Texas. Uh, Mr. Hodges, can you begin by giving us a little bit of background on yourself, uh, to start with, where and when were you born? I was born in Houston, Texas, 1951. And what did your family do at that time? Uh, my dad was actually a radio and TV repair guy and owned his own business for 26 years. And uh, my mother helped him with the business. And uh, Did you grow up in Houston or did you move around? Uh, we actually stayed pretty much right there in Houston, but uh, I was pretty active, so I stayed out in the uh, outlying communities and worked a lot of the ranches, uh, training horses, uh, working cattle, and I've been a cowboy all my life, so uh, I kind of moved around. Everybody else stayed in one place. All right. Now, did you finish high school? Yes, I did. Okay. And then did you consider college at that point or just going off to be a cowboy? No, I actually... Uh, uh, thought about college because uh, right across the street from us was Dr. Durham, who they named Durham Clinic after, he was really big in the Houston area, and he offered to actually send me to medical school and pay my way, and both of my older sisters were already uh, chief nurses for Dr. DeBakey and Dr. Cooley, and my youngest sister was actually the chief surgical nurse for Dr. John Hill, the murder in Texas doctor that killed his wife. So uh, we had a pretty big uh, hand in the medical community. And uh, for some reason, uh, my uh, vocation always seemed to me to be on the soldier side of things. So I decided I was going to join the Army and make it a career. Okay. And when did you enlist? Uh, July of 1970. Okay. Now, at that time, uh, you enlisted in 1970. The Vietnam War has been going on for some time. Did you assume that when you enlisted, you'd probably go over there? Yeah. Right. And in fact, I was a sole surviving son, so I didn't have to go. And, uh, but I went anyway. Okay. What motivated you, do you think, to do that? What was, mm -hmm. Why did you think this was the right thing to do for you then? Uh, you know, when uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head, I grew up with that, not only that war, but the Cold War. And every day in our school, we had air raid drills and hit under our desk, and uh, we were scared to death of nuclear destruction. So we had two wars we fought as little kids all the way through. And uh, I learned a long time ago from being uh, who I was that you don't mess with bullets. So when the bully raises his head, you better hit him and hit him hard. And uh, I saw a bully beating up on uh, a particular place there in Vietnam. Uh, and I guess more of the talk of my family. My dad kind of held the inside of all that after serving in World War II and Korea. Gave me a little different spin on it. So I decided that uh, if you're going to be a soldier, you better do something. And uh, if there's a fight going on, you better get in it. Uh, my whole purpose was to help the uh, Vietnamese people secure freedom. And being a cowboy, uh, you know what freedom is better than anybody else because you're out on a free open range and there's nothing quite like being your own boss. And I really couldn't stand the thought of... Uh, all these people, the images that you saw on the TV, being bullied by a government. I've always been about people. I, don't, I could care less about governments because they come and go. People never do. So uh, that's what uh, uh, motivated me in that direction. I really wanted to do my job and really wanted to help out. And as my daddy told me, uh, I know you're going to enlist. So if you do that, he said, I'm not going to try to discourage you, but I will tell you this. You better be the best that ever was. So I did. All right. Now, once you enlisted, uh, where did you get sent for training? Uh, first stop was uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. And that's where I did my basic training there at uh, North Fort. And everybody at North Fort knew where they were going. So we were all bound for Vietnam, everybody. Now, were some of them still draftees, or were they mostly now enlistees? Most were enlistees. We had uh, just about a handful of volunteers, I mean, uh, draftees. And uh, uh, that's, that's kind of a, some of the scuttlebutt I've always heard when I got back from the war, is all of your poor boys are all drafted and used as cannon fodder. And that wasn't true. Uh, I saw that uh, myself with my own eyes and uh, talked to many veterans since that time. And... Uh, that, that's kind of a misconception. 
And of course, there is that group in the middle who enlisted because they figured they were going to get drafted, and so they'd at least exercise some control over where they went. And yeah, they some did. of them did, and some of them did very well. Some of them were helicopter pilots, uh, whether they went to Vietnam or not, irrelevant. But you know, back then that was pretty good stuff because there was a good market after you got through with your enlistment for any kind of aviation jobs in those days. Uh, some of the guys went into uh, specialized fields and had actually helped them with business where they, uh, a lot of them, I've got a friend of mine that actually got his JD degree and uh, became an attorney in the Army and re actually retired and he never thought about doing that. He, he enlisted because he had a low draft number. He uh, wasn't going to run off to Canada, wasn't going to burn his draft card, he did what he was supposed to do. And so uh, he, uh, after a couple of years, he, uh, somebody within there uh, influenced him towards that, uh, the law, and he liked it. And, uh, did very well. So, yeah, there was a lot of guys that did did good. Uh, some guys joined, and very honestly, they uh, found out that they weren't what needed to be a soldier, and it and it took them away. All right. Uh, now, what does basic training consist of in 1970? Uh, you did eight weeks of basic training, and at Fort Polk, it was unique because you had North Fort and South Fort. They're separated by about 15 or 20 miles. So infantry walked. Every day, full pack rifle, field gear, uh, in 114 degrees, 100 percent humidity, chewing 15, 20 salt tablets a day. And uh, I was telling them last night that uh, we always had a joke, you know, if you were eating uh, sea rations, well, you wanted salt on your food, you just did like this, you know, because your, your green uniform was white, literally. Uh, and so uh, that was kind of what we did to get in shape for where we were going. But uh, it was uh, mainly filled with PT, physical training, every day, all day. Uh, and I mean, they, they burnt you up. And uh, you separated the men from the boys very quickly from the very first day. You got called every name in the book. Uh, so it was rough and it was uh, very strict because we were at war. Uh, we also did something that I noticed that the Army just dropped. And part of our uh, uh, focus was bayonet training. And bayonet training not only trains you to use a bayonet, but it instilled a spirit in you that you don't quit. You don't lay down, and your arm can be blown off, you fight with the other one. But you don't ever stop, and you don't ever fall. And uh, so I'm very sorry to see him give that up. That's, that's an integral part of the spirit of a warrior. It has nothing to do with bayonets. It has to do with uh, an idealism of what you're going to do, how you're going to save your life and others around you. And you don't do that by quitting or giving up. So. Uh, <clears throat> We did that. We broke down weapons, took them apart, put them back together till we were blue in the face. Learned every uh, light weapon there is in the military services from the uh, 45 pistol all the way to the 106 recoilless rifle. Uh, and uh, went to the range every day and uh, fired a, uh, uh, mostly fired the M16s and the M60 machine guns. And uh, then uh, uh, we, we had quite a bit of stuff to learn, military code of justice, uh, you know, all the paperwork side of it. And uh, dismounted drill. So we marched and marched in formation and learned all the what we call Jodies, you know, uh, cadence calls. That, uh, you know, we all marched down the boulevard singing. So that's the way we spent our eight weeks. Uh, if we were lucky, we got 15 minutes in the mess hall. So if you had a long line, you're just out of luck. And if you didn't get to eat, you learned very quickly that uh, you could do without a meal and not die but you had to take care of yourself and you had to use your head. Uh, we learned how to conserve water. We learned how to uh, do all the things that survival entails uh, all in that eight week period. So pretty intense. Okay. Now, were your drill instructors people who mostly had been in Vietnam by then? So all they, of them. They knew, they, so they knew what you were going into. Yes. And 114 degrees, 100 percent humidity sounds like reasonable practice. I yes, think. it was. And uh, because Vietnam was far worse than that. And uh, you, you could take somebody here and put them through whatever you could design and call it hell. You wouldn't know what hell was till you got there. It was a different kind. So uh, all of our drill sergeants were well seasoned, been in the Army for years. All of them were not only Vietnam veterans, they were all combat veterans. Every one of them were infantry combat veterans. They were handpicked by our brigade commanders uh, for outstanding service. So we got trained by the best of the best. 
Now, after the eight weeks of basic, where do you go next? Uh, I myself split off, and that's, that's kind of where you split off in your military career. Uh, I split off, and I went to leadership preparation school there at uh, Fort Polk. Uh, I left there, went to Fort Benning, Georgia, and, uh, or I'm sorry, I was still at Fort Polk. I went through eight more weeks of what's called AIT, Advanced Individual Training uh, in Infantry. And when I got out of that, I was a, a specialist fourth class, light weapons specialist. And I, I left there, went to Fort Benning, Georgia, went through uh, NCO school there, so I was non-commissioned officer candidate school. And uh, I forget how long that was. It was a pretty intense course, though. And uh, halfway through that, I, I got in contact with a man that uh, actually was another mentor of mine that helped me decide of where I was going. And uh, he was a contract operator through the intelligence community. And so they took a group of us that they had been watching through training. And uh, we were the first group that I know of that I ever heard of. And we were cross-trained in Ranger School at Fort Benning and also Special Forces Training Camp up at uh, Fort Bragg. And uh, we finished our NCOC, graduated as Sergeant E-5. And uh, we were told at the end of that by this guy and his group, uh, that at some point in time we may be called to do some other type of missions and they wanted to make sure that there were people already trained and, and ready reserve uh, so that when those came up they had these special skills and so uh, we uh, the mountains in northern Georgia seemed like the perfect place for that so we practiced repelling and we practiced uh, orienteering uh, did the confidence courses over and over and over went to the jump school deal uh, uh, you know all those kind of things that you do in, in special forces training uh, included uh, in that was a just a remarkable unit in hand-to-hand -hand combat and bayonet fighting. And uh, the proudest day of my life was, and I've had a lot of awards, but the proudest day of my life, we had a drill sergeant named Rosas. I don't remember his first name, uh, but he was uh, uh, from Mexico, and he was the toughest guy I ever met. He was about 5'4", uh, weighed about 140 pounds soaking wet, but he was solid. And... Uh, he was a bayonet fighter, and I wanted to be like him. <clears throat> so I listened to him intently, and we took the bayonets with a sheath on them, and we coated it with shoe polish, black polish, so it simulated a cut in certain places if you hit somebody with it. And uh, I got pretty dang good at it. I practiced. And uh, the day that we went to leave there, he walked up to me, just kind of off the cuff unofficially, walked by me in formation and stopped right in front of me, turned around and stared at me with his hat brim down there, kind of spooked me a little bit. And he reached out, instead of touch, uh, you know, saluting or anything, he just reached out and touched me on the shoulder. And he kind of, little bit of a smile, and he, bayonet fighter. That, that was it. Uh, that's the greatest award I ever got. So. What do you think was the most challenging or difficult part of that training, whether out of NCO school or out of uh, Ranger school? Mm -hmm. uh, probably the confidence course and the orienteering course were probably the hardest because uh, uh, in some cases it was uh, raining or, you know, the weather was bad and there's mud all over everything. And the hardest thing I had with was things that were high up because I always had a fear of heights. And if you're climbing on a bunch of old telephone poles that are muddy and they're wet and there's four or five other guys around you, all of you trying to beat each other to the top, you don't want to be the last one because you know you're going to have to do it again. So uh, that was pretty spooky there. Uh, the other thing, uh, ironically, was at Fort Polk, going on those force marches uh, at night, that was really, really hard because your uh, full pack rifle during a hot day, your clothes are already turned white with salt but you're still out there at night. Now the salt begins to work like sandpaper against your skin everywhere where you make contact. You're raw everywhere, bleeding and uh, dehydrated. And the sand out there when they took you through the, the wooded area uh, in North Fork was so deep that you would sink all the way almost to your waist. And you're fighting that trying to, it's almost like drowning. And you're fighting that, you can't see where in the hell you're going. And if you lose everybody, you're lost. So that, that was a little spooky because, uh, you know, we didn't know it. They had people out there, spotters, to make sure we didn't get left. But we didn't know that. Uh, and I guess the final thing was the, uh, uh, the night course. We used to go through the, uh, 
uh, I forget the name of the, the that training. I can't believe I forgot that. Anyway, uh, it was an infiltration course. That's what it was. And so we had barbed wire down on the ground, and you crawl underneath that, and they're shooting. Uh, in those days, they shot live rounds over your head. Uh, and they had a M60 machine gun on a T&E mechanism, and it's locked. And it couldn't go anywhere, couldn't hit you in a million years, but we didn't know that. So all you see is kind of looks like streams of red Kool-Aid flying over you. And that was the tracer rounds coming out of those machine guns. And there were uh, things blowing up uh, everywhere. They had grenade simulators here and there. Uh, the one at Fort Benning, Georgia, was uh, kind of a real eye-opener for me and a prelude of what I was getting ready to get involved in because one of the guys panicked and crossed, crawled out of the, uh, the uh, 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 main part of the wire we were under. He crawled over to the side, and when they blew the simulator, it got him. And so uh, I just, uh, <laughs> I don't know what possessed me to do it. I just ran over there and grabbed him and picked him up and ran back with him and started doing what I was trying to do. I started doing the first aid on it. And uh, so I guess that was my first uh, indication, uh, not only to myself, but all the people that were watching me, uh, that uh, I was the man they wanted to, to do other things. So uh, that, that was, uh, that was those, those type of uh, uh, training scenarios were pretty good. Now, after you completed this more specialized training, uh, do you now get assigned to a regular unit, or what happens to you next? No, actually, uh, they were in a hurry to get me to Vietnam uh, uh, because they had invested a lot of money and a lot of training in me, and they wanted to get some return, I guess. So uh, I went right straight from there, went back to Fort Polk, Louisiana. I was a drill sergeant uh, assigned to the uh, 5th AIT training brigade there. And I was only there, I was just on a temporary duty status, so I wasn't really a drill sergeant, but I was there doing the job. And about, uh, I don't think I was there, maybe five or ten days. And I was out at the machine gun range. A uh, sergeant pulled up, called my name, told me to get in the Jeep, went back. Company commander said, Levy went, came down and your name's on it. So I left there, went back to uh, Houston, uh, saw my uh, parents and my girlfriend, and headed for Oakland, California right away. And I got out there and uh, uh, shipped out from Oakland right straight to Vietnam. Okay. Now, how did they get you physically from Oakland out to Vietnam? Uh, well, we flew. And so uh, I was trying to remember the first time I went over. Uh, we went from there to Alaska, flew to uh, Japan, and then landed at Saigon or Benoit, one of the two. And were you on commercial aircraft or military aircraft? Or no, we were on uh, commercial aircraft. They had uh, uh, some... Uh, pretty good sized jets, I guess, 707s or something like that, you know, kind of have the four engines on the wings. And uh, so we flew on those, and uh, kind of an odd deal. It's a long, long flight. I think it's 32, 34 hours. And, of course, nobody knew anybody, so you're just kind of sitting there the whole time. Wasn't a whole lot to do. All right. And do you remember actually landing then in, in, in Vietnam and getting off the plane for the first time? Yeah. And uh, I covered that 2006 when I came up here and did a presentation uh, at the uh, Gerald Ford Museum uh, because uh, the very first time we flew, we had to circle the runway because they were mortaring it at the time. And as I looked out the window, I saw this landscape cratered surface below me. And all of my high expectations of self-promotion went out the window. And the first thing I thought was, what in the hell did I get myself into and how in the hell am I going to get out of this? And uh, when we landed, it was like just total chaos. There were people wounded. There was smoke and gunpowder in the air. Uh, and, you know, the, the landing was rotten. <laughs> uh, we had the old ladder, you know, they bring over to the plane. And everybody was scared to death coming off of that. And uh, they take you immediately right into the, uh, uh, this reception area and uh, started the uh, deal with your, uh, uh, doing your uh, quick physical. And then, of course, with us, uh, they pulled all of us off to the side and they did a uh, uh, deal with your teeth and they gave us the, these fluoride treatments for our, for our teeth and stuff. Uh, and uh, that was pretty much it. Gave us our jungle fatigues, things like that, and our helmets and everything but anything to shoot with. We didn't have anything. So we were like, Where, where's the gun? You know, come on. So uh, they didn't do any of that, uh, but that, that was the original 
reception, and that was just very quick. I mean, just as fast about as I just said it. So not much orientation. And then did they move you out into the field right away? Or right away. Happened? Yeah, I went right straight from there. We got on a, a deuce and a half truck, and they took me, and I think there was about six, seven other guys with me, and we were all infantry uh, soldiers, all infantry designation. Uh, they took us over to um, one of the other airfields. I don't, because I, I was in there, I never bothered to ask anybody if it was Saigon or Ben Wah, they're both right there together. But uh, we went to another airfield and they put us on a C-130 Hercules. And we flew out of there, uh, flew all the way to Da Nang. We got in Da Nang and we flew by uh, Huey. Huey helicopter picked us up and uh, flew us over to uh, Camp Eagle in uh, Way City there. And so uh, once we got there, they split us all up, told us, you know, you're going here, you're going there, blah, 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 blah. And uh, we finally got issued a weapon and got some ammo and frags and all kinds of neat stuff and some sea rations. And being new in the country, I didn't pay much attention to my training uh, because there was a lot of pressure on me. So I naturally loaded up with more food than I did water and ammo. And that came back to haunt me in about two days. So uh, they, they put me in a Jeep, kind of funny, I got in a Jeep and it was just me and the Jeep driver. And we left Camp Eagle, drove way out in the countryside, you know, down the, the jungle there. Uh, pretty wide open though. And saw this big hill up ahead of me, <laughs> it looked like uh, it had all eroded off and you see the big cannon sitting up on top of it. And that was Firebase Birmingham. And so they dropped me off Firebase Birmingham and uh, I was walking around looking for a friend and nobody wanted to talk you know, because they knew I was a new guy, and they had names for us. So it uh, uh, wasn't a great deal of respect for you until you earned it. And uh, I waited for a little while, and uh, next thing you know, these helicopters started coming in. And uh, the first one that came in, they I expected it would touch down and stop for some reason. And I knew better than that. But they, they pulled in there, and they're all doing this. And um, so I ran over there, and they pulled me in the doorway. And you just sat in the door like this with your feet hanging out the helicopter. And uh, they took off that just that quick, never really touched down. And so we left, and I'm sitting there trying to find out what was going on. And I asked the guy next to me, I was screaming, you know, where are we going? And he, never, he just never looked at me. Everybody was just staring at the, I guess, the ground. Nobody saying anything, nobody looking at anybody. Very quiet uh, as far as that went. And next thing you know, man, we started landing out in the in the middle of this jungle and uh, came into this LZ. And the minute I got in there, they knew I was a new guy. So they just grabbed me and threw me out of the helicopter about five feet up in the air. And I wasn't expecting that. So I came out kind of upside down and uh, not real gracefully and lost my weapon in the process. And uh, they all hit the ground and everybody was shooting. So I jumped up and I was, you know, trying to figure out if I had the, the barrel facing the right way and who was out there and what am I supposed to shoot at. And, somebody tell me something but you couldn't hear a damn thing because the helicopter had both of the door gunners firing and everybody on us were firing and so uh it it was uh, pretty hectic there for a while i really didn't shoot i was just kind of looking around and i thought well i better shoot because they're gonna think i'm a chicken or something and then i thought well maybe i might i might hit somebody if i cut loose you know and uh so i just looked at where they were mainly firing and i kind of opened up fired a few magazines out there you know and next thing you know they all quit Nobody said a word, everybody just quit. And it wasn't like chopped off quit, it was like gradually you're, the rounds quit. And uh, they all turned around, rolled over on their rucksack. Some of them started uh, getting their pipes out and smoking their pipes or rolling a cigarette. You know, we had bull derm and had all kinds of cigarettes there. And uh, yeah, it was kind of a strange feeling. I started trying to see who was in charge of everything. Then I realized I was a sergeant, and we're in a small unit, so there's only like uh, six people. So I thought, well, I wonder if they're expecting me to do something, and they just think they're going to goof off, and uh, I'm not going to do anything. So maybe they're testing me. So I was sitting there, and I go, uh, where, where did you men just come from? And of course, nobody answered, and they just completely ignored me. And uh, within a little while, they all started standing up, ruck up. And they all started getting their rucksacks on. Well, I got mine on, and they all took off walking. 
And so I was sitting there looking, and I saw the one guy walk out about two, three hundred yards ahead of everybody else, and then the next guy went out, and then there was about another fifty to a hundred yards behind him, and then there was a another guy, and then a radio telephone operator, and then a machine gunner and assistant gunner. So I was sitting back there, and I walked up, and I figured the guy with the radio was somebody, but all he had on was a torn up T-shirt, and pretty ugly looking. And uh, I said, "Excuse me," I said, "Are you in charge here?" said, get back in the rank, shut up. All right, no problem. So we walked and walked and walked and walked uh, until uh, I just, I don't even remember uh, uh, too much of where we went other than it was uh, kind of a, a wide open terrain, you know, kind of rolling hills, uh, waded through some water, like some ditches. And finally we stopped, and when we did, the guy said, well, you better eat something. I said, all right. I said, thank you. I'm just trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. And he turned around and looked at me and he said, stay alive. Let's start there. So uh, I learned very quickly that it, 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 what they were trying to tell me indirectly is, you got to do this on your own. This is an individual effort. There ain't no mama here. Your daddy ain't here. Uh, nobody's going to have sympathy on you. Uh, you man up. So uh, I finally got it. And after that, that night, we all just laid there, and it was raining like cats and dogs, freezing to death. And uh, next day we got up. He said, uh, get up there and walk slack. And that was the man right behind the point man. And he said, you watch him, and you do everything he does. You do it when he does it. You do what he says. Don't talk. Hand and arm signals on. I catch you talking, I'll put a bullet in you myself. And all right. So that's the way we started off. And, uh, All right. So the way you described this, essentially, you're going in there now. When you first got, when you got to the LZ that you went out from with this group of guys, uh, did someone at least write down the fact that you were there, or did somebody know you had arrived? You just show. No. So, so no one talks to you really at all. No. You just stand there, and they pick you up, and you get all of this weight, and no one yet has actually told you what you're supposed to be doing. No. All right. Not at all. Now, this fellow, where you say he tells me something. Was that that turned out to be the person actually in charge of the he, unit? Yeah, and he turned out to be another Sergeant E-5. He was the squad leader. And uh, uh, the only thing I knew was his nickname was Dutch. And he was only there a few months because he was already getting short, meaning he was getting ready to go home. Uh, but we found out we were both from Texas. So he was from Belton, Texas, and I told him where I was from. So we had kind of a, uh, a little better bond maybe than what it would have been maybe without that and uh, so uh, after about the third day we, we did finally hit a little contact right outside of Birmingham and uh, that's what we were actually doing is setting up ambush patrols to keep the fire base from getting uh, hit and so we found some rocket tubes uh, and we knew that they had just set them up and, uh, and Dutch thought that uh, you know they were going to come back and arm them and, and go ahead and shoot because they didn't think we were in the area so we set up some claymores on them and booby trapped them so when they came back and tried to load the tube, it was set off the claymores and kill everybody out there. So I helped them set them up, and I was, I was pretty good at, at that. And that was one of the things that was my, uh, I guess, the Special Forces camp gave me was indirect warfare. So I showed them how to wire up a booby trap pretty dang good, and they, they kind of got endeared to me after that. That kind of seemed to be the thing that broke the ice, that this kid really does know something. And, uh, so we did all kinds of things like that, uh, and uh, you know, Dutch finally told me after a few, several days, I guess, that he was short. You know, he's he's going home, and I'd be the one taking over. And he said, "I tell you right now," he said, "Don't ever think you're going to get away with telling any of these guys what to do, because they will kill you." Well, he said, uh, "The trick is, each man stays alive, because each man does his job, and they do it exact, and we do not tolerate mistakes." Mistakes mean somebody dies. You better not. You better not be the one that makes it. So uh, uh, that was a pretty good, uh, uh, pretty good direction for me. And I got to watch him and uh, be with him and learn how to call artillery and uh, call airstrikes when we needed them from who we needed them from. If they were going to be uh, some type of napalm we needed laid down, or if we needed uh, closer support, you know, we'd try to get a Cobra gunship to come out and uh, shoot down there for us. So. Uh, uh, it was a really good uh, OJT for me 
getting in country, and I learned very quickly from the first day I was out there that these guys were not only hardcore, but they were like machines. Everybody did exactly uh, what their job was, and there were no mistakes. I mean, uh, these guys were as good as they got. At this point, were you attached to a larger unit or organization, and to the 101st Airborne, or anyone else, or were you just entirely independent, as far as you could tell? Yeah, we were. Uh, we always worked in squads. The only time we worked as a company was one time, and that was during the operation I'm going to talk about tonight at the Ford, and that was a crash of a Chinook helicopter we went to recover on uh, Thanksgiving of 1971. Uh, that was the only time we ever grouped up as a company. But uh, I served as part of Delta Company. Uh, 2nd Battalion, 502nd Infantry, the 101st Airborne Division. And uh, I was in the 2nd uh, Platoon, and if I'm not mistaken, I went from 2nd to 4th Squad uh, uh, leader. And uh, because we changed around, sometimes somebody get knocked out or get medevaced out where you had to take over and maybe run both squads. Uh, and uh, we might group two squads together. But a squad could be as many as seven men and could be as few at sometimes as four, depending on your combat strength at the time. Okay. Uh, now, did you stay in the Birmingham area for an extended period of time, or were you moving around? Uh, we actually moved right out of there. We only stayed there just about a week, uh, which, you know, a week there is like 70 years here. Uh, and uh, we actually focused then uh, mainly on a uh, azimuth. If you draw straight from Way City uh, west, going into uh, the Ashaw Valley, around the old Hamburger Hill battle site, all those areas right there. Uh, that's where we operated out of. And uh, uh, it was kind of a neat little title I got because the guy has called me the King of the North. And I knew that country better than anybody. And uh, I made a study out of it because uh, most people didn't study terrain maps. But again, going back to my cowboy roots, I knew that you know, you're on a big ranch, especially down in Texas, if you're working in saltgrass country. Saltgrass can get so high you can't see out, even if you're on the back of a horse, and there's no trees there. So you can't find landmarks. And if you can't see the sun, you're in a bit of trouble. Uh, you go the wrong way, you could die and, and that kind of thing. So uh, I already had a good foundation for uh, reading maps and understanding the land and uh, knowing that you always, 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 no matter what you do, where you go, you always know where the hell you're at, and you know where the hell you're going, and you know where, how to get the hell out of there if you need to. So those were, those were my three keys there, and I drilled that into my guys. And they used to get mad at me because they well, you pull all that paper all over us. We don't need all, you know, you just lead the way. No, because if I get blown up, you better know what to do. I want you to make it out of here too. So they kind of got that idealism uh, pretty quickly. They understand it, understood that um, uh, one of my big uh, mentors, other than my uh, dad, was General Patton. You know, I always liked his uh, not only hands-on uh, methodology, but the fact that he, he wasn't afraid to lead. And he also wasn't afraid to let everybody know that uh, you, you, you got to be a part of this. You got to study it. You got to really put some effort behind it if you want to get out of this or you want to accomplish the mission. And I think that's the thing that I instilled in them that they didn't really have at that time. It was just kind of this existence mode, stumbling around from day to day. But we really took up this mission-oriented thing, and we really got involved within ourselves and within our group. And our goal was not only to live through the war, but to accomplish our missions each and every time, just exactly the way they laid them out to us. So uh, that went a long way in leadership to set these guys on fire. And I think, too, looking back on it, uh, I wasn't aware of it then. I wish I could say I was. But I think that it distracted them enough from the danger, from the, the sheer terror and trying to look back all the time. It inspired them to uh, set goals and set these missions in their mind and really be determined to accomplish them. Now, did you stay with this group for sort of the full year in country, or were you no. moving in and out? No, I, w I was there just to kind of get my feet wet. Okay. Uh, I was pulled out of there uh, for my special op missions. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, and I, uh, I have to uh, go back and think about this pretty hard because it was, uh, you know, a day over there, you don't really know what day it is. You're not really cognizant of that. Uh, but 
as memory serves me, it was somewhere between the end of January, uh, March, April, somewhere in there, because it was still during monsoon season. Uh, and uh, uh, that's when uh, the, the guy that I came to know came and got me. And so they took me back, uh, flew me out to VTOC, which was the intelligence center there at uh, uh, the Firebase. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was on Firebase Birmingham. Uh, they flew me to Da Nang, and I got a briefing there with uh, another, uh, uh, MACV was actually located right there, the, the briefing uh, center. So they took me in there, uh, and th there was a room full, of <laughs> room full of these guys. It's kind of spooky because you expect them to be in uniform and uh, be military guys, and they're not. And uh, they just kind of dressed about like you are, and they're just really kind of uh, look the farthest thing from a soldier there is. I mean, they're not, there's nothing special. I mean, they're just kind of like sitting there. So uh, I saw the, the man that kind of mentored me in there, and he said, well, this is where you uh, see what you're really made out of. And so they explained to me the, the missions there. And the mission was to, uh, Nixon was trying to pull the troops out, but they were really afraid that there was going to be another, and they knew there was, because the buildup was already taking place another Tet Offensive like 68 to damage our image and to blow Nixon out of the water. And they wanted to embarrass him uh, and really make him look bad. Uh, so our job, as it was explained to me, was to go in and we were going to be inserted into Laos because I knew that corridor. I knew that, that particular area. And uh, they knew that I could orienteer out there and study, you know, do the maps right. So we were going to be inserted in there. A uh, five-man team, get to handpick anybody you want. And uh, the whole idea was to disrupt the supply lines and really give them hell. And the Arvins had already demonstrated they couldn't do it. They got almost wiped out during Lamson 719 trying to do the same thing. So they were afraid to do that, but they didn't want U.S. troops involved. So uh, we were dressed in uh, Viet Cong outfits with, uh, you know, the sash and everything. And the only thing we wore different was we wore NBA boots. We didn't wear the sandals. Uh, they outfitted us with AK-47s. A couple of us had uh, SKS and uh, things like that. And so uh, what they were going to do, they had intelligence from whatever sources they got it from. I don't know where they got it. But uh, they found out certain elements were moving to a certain place and give us the mission, give us the grid coordinates of where we were going to get C-8 in, where we were going to hump to immediately, and then what we were going to do and then our rendezvous point was the key because it, we, we had no radio. So if you miss the rendezvous point on the day and time, you're, you're just over there. I didn't put two and two together then. But I realized that by uh, doing that, everybody in our unit was, looked like me. There was nobody over 5'8". We all had black hair. My skin was very dark then from being out in the sun. I could have easily pass for Eurasian or NBA, especially if I was disfigured. Uh, but we had no dog tags or anything. So if they did find us and even did identify us as Americans by some method, they would be able to throw their hands up and say, those guys were over there selling drugs or part of the black market. You know, they're, they're, uh, we had, you know, they're, we've been looking for them, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, uh, that was the way we operated. We did our uh, special missions. Uh, when that was completed, and it only lasted a few weeks, we just went in there and kicked everybody in the butt pretty dang hard uh, and uh, came out, and it worked. It worked. How does it sort of actually work? Are you doing ambushes or? Yeah, we, we would follow a, a unit, and what worked out for us and our advantage was when they move in Laos, they move in groups, big groups, and they're very relaxed because they didn't expect us to be there or anybody formidable opponent to be there. And because of their mass numbers, I think they just felt it kind of lulled them into a false sense of security. But they were coming through, of course, with elephants. They had mules, real mules. They had uh, uh, big trucks, tanks in some cases, heavy equipment. So what we did, we followed them for several days, very close. And we'd see who they were, and we'd mark their vulnerabilities. In other words, uh, if they had a couple of elephants with a lot of equipment on them, we knew that we could take a pound of C4 and put it on each of those elephants and explode that stuff uh, right in the morning is when we normally hit them because that's right when everybody's getting up, they're packing everything up, their mind's not really alert, and they're just getting ready to move. Some of them are eating a little bit of rice or whatever they got. 
and all of a sudden one of the elephants explodes and, uh, you know, the whole thing goes to hell. Uh, we uh, mapped out directions. If we saw them moving on a particular azimuth, what we would do is we knew they were going to move this way in the morning, for sure, because we'd see the point patrols sometimes would go out, they'd kind of check everything and come back. And you got to remember, these were roads. I mean, they well traveled. So if we knew they were going to go that way, we'd sneak in there at night and we'd set up a horseshoe ambush for, for the column. So if this was the column moving this way, the ambush was Claymore, 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 Claymore. Then you got a guy here with an M60 machine gun, a guy here with an M60 machine gun, M203, M203. And then in the front, another M203. If all you had was AKs, then you, you did the same thing, same setup. Two here, two there, one on the point. I always took the point. That was my position. And so we'd set the clackers up where we could self-detonate them. Uh, I, each team member had one. And we were in so close on them that by the time they got a hit, and you, uh, the M60s would be the final thing that kept going as the first three team members began to run. We'd split in five different directions. So that way, if they caught one of us and hunted us down, we only lost one team member versus losing the whole team. And we'd run through the, the brush. Everybody knew how to orienteer to get back to our rendezvous point. And if you made it to the rendezvous point, fine. If you didn't, we moved on. How do you get pound of C4 on an elephant? Uh, pretty easy. You just strap it on him. And a lot of the elephants, uh, if they're uh, laying on the ground at night or they're standing up, most of them sleep standing up, you just walk up there and they've got these uh, apparatuses on them, uh, kind of like a pack on a horse. And so they've got a girt cinch in the front, one in the back, and you just hide it up underneath the saddle of that uh, uh, pad and uh, you run your clacker out there. Uh, you can uh, set them to time detonate. So there's all kinds of tricks you can pull on. Uh, and uh, you can actually, uh, we used to do a trick with hand grenades. So you take a hand grenade and you screw the smoke, I mean the, the uh, delay fuse out. You put a smoke fuse in it and you spray it green. So to the unknowing eye, it's a time delayed hand grenade. But all they got to do is pull that pin and the minute they release the spoon, it explodes. And there's no time delay. So uh, we would lay a few of those around so that if they pick them up off the trail, we knew they would. Uh, the other thing we do is, is hook them up like a booby trap. So you hook that up underneath the saddle there and you take the, the back part and run the pin down with a trip wire to the back cinch. Uh, you know they're going to start cinching that booger up and when they do, they'll pull the pin out and it'll self-detonate and it'll blow the elephant sky high. But in the meantime, you're able to sort of walk into their camp or whatever and just walk up to the elephants and... Yeah. Because yeah. you dress like them and it's still a little dark. Not only dress like them, but darkness out there is, uh, uh, varies in degrees. And our old saying was, everybody dies on the full moon. So that's what we did. And they could see us. They could see the outline of us, but we're the same height as them, about the same weight and build. They never paid us any attention. And uh, we just walked around the camp, did what we were going to do. And as I said, you know, they're very laid back. I mean, they'd be playing music and doing all kinds of stuff and singing and they had campfires going and cooking food, and uh, some of them moved uh, very quick and very uh, expedient, and they, they uh, ate on the run, ate on the move, and they didn't have a whole lot of uh, heavy equipment. But some of them, you know, if you had like an officer with them or somebody that was really high ranking or you had a lot of uh, real important supplies, they really put on the dog. And I mean, they'd carry a lot of stuff and really, uh, you know, cook some pretty elaborate meals and stuff for, for them. A pot of fish is pretty elaborate for them. Uh, but that's, uh, uh, that's the way we did those. And about how many of this sort of mission do you think you ran? Uh, actually, probably about 10. And at the end, we had to quit because uh, our last, uh, uh, or my last one, uh, I, I made it to the rendezvous point. Nobody else showed up. So uh, I waited and waited. I waited about two days, and uh, nobody came for me. So I realized I couldn't wait any longer because they were all over me. So I decided I was going to take off. And uh, I, again, used orienteering. I went right, not hard, because you're almost due west of way, so you kind of turn due east and head back. And uh, 
I made it uh, 72 days by myself and uh, got back to uh, a road, I believe it was QL9 at the time, and they had brought up some uh, uh, artillery units and some Arvins to support the border down there. And uh, I, I was, I saw them uh, while I was walking and I got really excited. I was going to run over there, you know, and hey, you know, get me out of here. And then all of a sudden I caught myself because I didn't have a shirt left anymore and I'm in these black pajama pants with my NBA boots on and no dog tag. And I looked like them. So and I had blood every square inch of my body and uh, pretty filthy. And I had a beard down to here and my hair was, was pretty long. So it was looking pretty bad. And I was afraid they would shoot me, even if I chew hoid, I, because that was a free fire zone. You shot everything that moved. Man, animal, plant, didn't make any difference. Uh, so finally I figured, you know, uh, if I'm gonna get out of here, I'm gonna have to do something. So uh, I, I followed them for a little bit and I saw some of these guys seemed like they were pretty jovial dudes. <laughs> and I, I kinda had to be a good judge of character on that one. So I said, you know, I hope I'm right. So when they were taking a break, and I saw them get out their sea rations and they're kind of eating those. And I went up to the Harvard unit first and uh, just walked out, you know, with my hands up this way and chew hoy, you know, I'm an American, don't shoot, you know, that kind of deal. And I was yelling uh, Yankee Doodle and um, what else did I say? Something about Babe Ruth or something, you know, <laughs> trying to think of all this stupid stuff, you know, that you, uh, corny crap that you see on uh, some movie somewhere. Uh, but it worked, and it scared the ever-loving hell out of them. And I mean, they, uh, you know, I thought they were going to shoot me, but they didn't, and they finally relaxed a little bit, and uh, they asked me several questions, and I answered them. And uh, so when they uh, finally took me in and I got to eat something, uh, they told me that they had these trucks going back, and so I waited, uh, stayed with them one day, and I got a ride on a deuce and a half going back through the mountains there. We got out on another road, and then there was, a, there was a big convoy of tank trucks. And I, I got a ride on the back of the tank truck. And uh, I was trying to remember what our mission was at that time, but I had a 1903 Springfield rifle with a star gauge bore and, and a scope I'd been doing some sniping with, and that's all I had left. And uh, so when we got back to uh, the camp there at Camp Eagle, well, they were waving the trucks through the gate and all of a sudden they saw me on the back of the truck and they all, you know, jumped to and this MP, uh, <laughs> he ran back in his guard shack and pulled out his M16 and told me to get off the truck and I did. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, look, you know, I'm one of you and you know, I was trying to talk to him. And he said, I'm gonna call uh, so-and-so. And I said, no, you need to call uh, the Colonel. And I gave him his name and I said, you, you tell him I'm here and I wanna know why I was left. And I was mad, so he, cranked the landline up and he started talking and he come back out and he said, I don't know who the hell you are, but he said, they said they'd be here. And here comes the MPs and it was kind of comical because it looked like Keystone cops. They came flying up there with their rifles waving and they were all white faced and, uh, you know, antsy. And they ordered me to drop my weapon and I told them I wasn't gonna do that. And it was a, pretty tense moment because I was dead and I was, I was mad and I was, I was meaner than a rabid dog at that time. And I would have killed him. And I told him, I said, no, I'm, I'm not gonna put a weapon down. You're gonna take me to the Colonel and you know where I'm supposed to go. And, but I'm not putting his weapon down. And we had a little standoff there and finally they must have realized I was serious. So uh, put me in a Jeep, took me over there. And of course, all I was told is shut up. You signed the agreement. You did your job, good job. And uh, they transferred me uh, right out of there that day. I went right out, got re-outfitted, new, new jungle fatigues and all that. Got a new rucksack, uh, M16. And uh, they flew me out to Da Nang and I was assigned then to the 196th Infantry Brigade. Right. Yeah. Now, let's then back up a little bit. You said you were 72 days. Yes. Right, I realize we've sort of talked about that in, in public elsewhere, but. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about just how, how you stayed alive and what you did over the course of those 72 days? Yeah. Well, a lot of walking, of course, uh, a lot of mountain climbing. Uh, the, the blessing up there in those mountains is that the water is crystal clear and you can drink right out of the streams. Uh, there's so many fish in there that you can't, I mean, they're everywhere. And it's like, uh, kind of like, uh, uh, you might describe it as prehistoric. I mean, there, there's never 
been anybody in parts of that, and so uh, it's a pretty phenomenal place. And uh, I ate the fish raw out of the streams, but I don't eat fish today. And uh, you had to eat them like an animal would eat them. So through the scales, uh, uncooked blood and all, fresh, because if you threw that thing down or, or the NVA found it, they would know that somebody would they'd track you down. And I didn't have time to cover my tracks. Uh, I was wearing NVA boots, I wasn't worried about that, but if they saw that kind of activity, they would probably know that there was some type of SOG group working in that area. And they weren't foreign to that, they, they knew SOG very well. So uh, anyway, I, I survived off of eating that fish out of there. Sometimes all I had was just sand, I'd just drink sand and uh, stuff like that to uh, keep something in my stomach, keep going. And uh, that's the way I did it, and uh, just hiding, you know, to hide. Uh, during the daytime, most of the time, I moved a lot at night, and uh, when I could see, sometimes you can't see your hand in front of your face, and I uh, was just very careful that uh, the areas that I went into were not uh, marked areas. I didn't follow trails, cut my own way. I had a little machete was about this long, so it was kind of hot, hot, chopped off, modified, and I used that. I didn't cut a lot of trail. I tried to slip through the jungle so that if somebody was following me, it would slow them down. It'd be much harder for them to catch me because they would have to cut trail to get me. And uh, just things like that, that's, that's the way you survive. And uh, again, like I say, just get mad dog mean. I mean, you, you gotta be determined that you're not gonna give up. Uh, you're never gonna lay down and you get the mission done no matter what. Did you have any close calls with North Vietnamese or whatever on that trip? Or yeah, I've had them step on my hand and one of them tripped over me right in the middle of the night. Uh, and. Uh, uh, things like that. The, the bad part was that I was bleeding. I had uh, shrapnel wounds in these arms, just they were pretty light wounds. It wasn't anything real serious. I had some in my face. I didn't know that till years later because when you got blood all over you, you don't know if it's yours or somebody else's and you really don't care at that time. If you're still vertical and breathing, you don't ask any questions because you're liable to find out you're hit. That ain't good. So uh, we just kind of play those games in our mind. And, uh, but the infection was the biggest part. And I got a really serious infection to where it was just burning me up, you know, I was getting delirious. And so uh, uh, all I remember was laying down. Uh, and next thing I knew, these mountain yard people were, were there. And I'm assuming they were mountain yard. I don't know if they were them or the Hmong or who they were, uh, but they were some type of nomadic tribes people there. And they didn't speak uh, English, and of course I didn't speak their dialect, they had different dialect altogether. I didn't understand anything. And I knew a little bit of Vietnamese, but none of what they were saying. But we all had this strange understanding. I understood they were trying to help me, and they did. And this, uh, whatever this potion was that these ladies had prepared was uh, pretty unusual, and it burned like all get out. I'm assuming it was some type of pepper uh, that they used. And, uh, but they uh, packed it up in these uh, wounds and stuff, and. Uh, got me doctored up, sent me on my way. And they offered me some food, uh, and I know it sounds stupid, but <laughs> you're eating fish through the scales raw, but whatever they had in this little pot, I couldn't bring myself to eat. It was, it was looking pretty rough. <laughs> sounds kind of silly. But, uh, you know, they were a big part of my survival there. I don't think I would have made it past that day. Uh, without their their intervention, and uh, so uh, you know that, that's uh, that's the way you do it. Had you taken the shrapnel wounds? Was that in the original fight when you were still? Yeah, when when everything was uh, blowing on this last deal, as I said, uh, that that was the one where I had the uh, the long range rifle, and we'd been doing some pot shots and things like that, uh, and I had uh, exchanged the M203 for the the sniper gun so we could kind of reach out and harass a little better. But more importantly, uh, uh, it, it gave me the ability to carry more claymore mines and more uh, frags and things like that that I could do my job with, which was that indirect warfare, making booby traps. We found out that was more effective against them than you know, trying to fire them up. And it was also less dangerous for us. We had a pretty close scrape the mission before that. And there was a rumor when we went back to get resupplied that one of the other teams had been completely lost. And so that was kind of on my mind at that time. Uh, so we wanted to try to move back away from them because, you know, you're only gonna pull those tricks so long. They're gonna get wise to you and that's why these missions were very short-lived. And they did catch on. 
And so this mission went terribly wrong. And I would imagine because of the explosion, uh, several of uh, uh, a couple of the team members there were probably taken out right then. And uh, whatever happened after that, because it just turned into pure uh, chaos. And like, I, I wasn't even aware that I was ever hit or had any injuries, wounds, anything, uh, uh, until several days later when I started running a fever. And uh, when you lay down, you know, the pain then finally started to creep in. So uh, uh, that, was, uh, that was the deal on that. They, they stopped the missions after that. Uh, I don't think they ever ran anymore. If they did, I wasn't aware of it, and I wouldn't have been privy to the information anyway. I had no idea how many teams were running or uh, if they were uh, within close proximity of us or we didn't talk about those things. We uh, didn't use our real names. You know, we used uh, some type of nickname, code name, whatever. So uh, that's, uh, that's kind of the way it went for me there. It was a pretty interesting trip, and uh, uh, you kind of learn a lot when you... Uh, uh, go through that about yourself, and you learn about uh, your uh, your enemy uh, is not as clear cut as people think. And so my eye of the warrior thing is to show people that uh, you know it, it's not the warrior that starts the trouble. It's always the government, the politicians, the people that uh, have some say. And you leave it up to the people. The people usually take care of themselves. Uh, so I've uh, seen a lot of cases where uh, NBA soldiers should have been shot and killed and for some reason they ran into the, the right patrol that day that, that let them live and uh, took them back, took them prisoner. They weren't supposed to do that totally against orders, but they did it. Uh, so that human element that creeps in when you uh, run into this where I think it's just the raw, uh, uh, the, the only place you can really see the raw soul of a human and know what you're really made of. Uh, character, you know, is what you are when nobody else is looking. Uh, and you find out real quick what kind of character you are. So, pretty profound lessons that you learn there. What was it, do you think, that maybe in your own character or wherever it was from, that enabled you just to stay focused for that amount of time and to stick to that mission? I've, I've been a cowboy all my life. You learn to focus, and you learn to be your own man, and you learn to take care of yourself. And uh, my my first job, I was, uh, I think, 14, and uh, showed up on this ranch, and I wanted to work there because the boss was a tough guy, and everybody respected him, and he was a big rancher and all that. But he was a horse-thinking type guy. He had some real nice horses, and I wanted to get my hands on them because I've been a horse-thinking type guy, too. And so I uh, wanted to do a good job for him, and the first day I was out there, I kind of rode up there next to him trying to impress him, you know. And he was just sitting up there watching his cattle operation and you could see he was concentrating. And he's writing stuff down on this little piece of paper. And I pulled up next to him and I said, well, Mr. Arnold, uh, what do you want me to do now? And he turned around and looked at me and he had this big wad of day's work in his mouth, you know, chewing tobacco. And he looked over there and, and he just spit right on my horse's nose. And he said, you can start with shutting up. Do what you're told when you're told to do it. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. And I, that was a great day. I mean, I was like, thank you. You know, and I wrote off, and you know what? I got to talk to the boss. You know what he told me? Shut up, you know. So I was, I was giddy, and, uh, uh, but that's the kind of guys that I grew up with. And uh, they, they uh, you know, you fall off your horse. You don't sit there and start saying, oh, my God, somebody help me. You know better than even open your mouth. Your arm's broken. You get up, put it inside your shirt. Get on your horse and you go get some help. But you don't sit there and start belly aching and start all this silly uh, mamby pamby stuff. So you get cut, you throw some dirt in it, uh, wrap it with your rag, get the blood stopped and you get on with your work. So I think truthfully that doing that all of my life was the precursor for this soldier that appeared and, and was able to, to do the job the way it had to be done. I kind of understood that stuff from, from birth. <laughs> uh, it's the sort of story that a number of the French soldiers in some of the places where they wound up in Indochina did the same thing. They're, they're gone for three months and then they appear someplace. Yes. You hear about it less with, with the Americans, but, but the same kind of thing. Yeah. Now, how long had you been in country at the point when you finished with this trip and special ops and get assigned to the 196th? Uh, I would say somewhere around five, six months maybe. 
and uh, I left. They, they uh, actually before I was assigned to the 196. I just remembered that I got to go back, and I got a. Uh, uh, they told me I'd have a two-week leave, and I. The rumor was I was going home. What I thought, and uh, so I, I got on the plane. And this time I flew on. It was the first time I ever flew on a 747. And I never forget that because you look at the movie playing and the, the fuselage doing this, a little spooky. But we flew then a different route. We flew from there to the Philippines, to Hawaii, and then back to Oakland. And uh, so I went home for uh, about a week and a half, I think it was. And uh, then they told me I had to go back. So when I loaded up, I went back. And uh, when I got uh, back, I guess it's the only time they ever explained it to me. Uh, but they told me, they said, you know, we're trying to, trying to find some guys that can lead this. This is the last infantry company in the field. And we've got to protect Da Nang. We don't want any embarrassments here and, and you know, that kind of thing. Because it's a major military base. You had VTOC there, MACB, everybody was there. And they needed time to pull out and, uh, you know, get everybody out of there. So we ran ambush patrols, and that was my forte. So uh, that's what I did. And then we taught these guys how to be machines instead of, uh, and, and I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, when I got there, it was, th this unit was in just terribly bad shape. And I, in fact, wrote a letter uh, to my dad telling him that we needed to get a congressional investigation going because of the uh, we didn't get resupplied on time, we didn't get medevacs on time. It was a mess. And uh, so anyway, he, he wrote the letter to the, the president of the VFW post that, that they all belonged to. And he wrote the letter to the president, and President Nixon uh, initiated a congressional investigation. And so uh, it was kind of odd because I didn't get it for four years later. Uh, substantiated the claims, but it didn't, in, and what's odd is, you know, typical mil military fashion. They put the, the kicker at the end of each allegation. Uh, the commander was, uh, was uh, uh, reminded of this, and steps were taken where to assure it will never happen again. Well, we're already out of the country. What, what are you going to do now? So uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they did that. Well, they did give us a little bit of help, uh, and uh, things weren't uh, terribly active then. We, we were kind of slowing down. Everything was kind of gearing down, and I believe the NVA probably realized uh, we're, we're going to go another strategy, and I think the strategy was to go ahead and let us pull out, and then they would just deal with the South Vietnamese on their own terms, and they wouldn't have to involve uh, uh, you know, the U.S. any longer. And uh, they were beat down. They were beat down very bad. And you, you see uh, General uh, uh, Gap, I can't remember if it was him or, and you know, he made the statement, I don't know why you guys quit. You had us on the ropes. Uh, we were on our last leg and, and you quit. Uh, but uh, they were beat down really bad. This and was late 70, 71, right? 72. In, in 72. Yeah, and the last, the last uh, the combat soldiers left the field uh, in 72 and that was the 196. They had a spring offensive in 72 mm -hmm. that did get down to the way area that they got pushed back again. Yeah, and we were part of that. Yeah. 196 actually flew from Da Nang up into the Way City, uh, and we uh, uh, helped out with that. They pushed the, uh, uh, they pushed the Arvins out in front of us. We gave them some uh, really good supporting fire, and then our, pi our pilots flew those missions. And uh, then we, uh, uh, they pulled us back to Da Nang. That, that was kind of short-lived, and I think, I don't know, so, uh, I, f I feel like personally that that mission went off half cock. Somebody got the wrong order somewhere from somebody, and, you know, it just went haywire because they, they gave up too easy. And the NVA are not known for that. They're known for coming on with everything they got. But uh, they did. They gave up too quick. And uh, we pulled back to Da Nang. We finished uh, working there, and uh, they pulled all the support personnel out. They pulled us out of the field, and, and that was it. Finally went home for good. Uh, two years later, of course, the uh, NVA had already moved into Saigon, and so uh, you know that was the the beginning of the you know the communist regime, regime there. Uh, what impression uh, did you have of uh, the South Vietnamese military, or what parts of it that you had contact with? Mm -hmm. I saw some of them that were kind of like our military in some ways. Some of them were good soldiers. Some of them didn't want to be there. Some of them, uh, generically, they would throw their guns down and run. They, they really didn't have the will to fight as 
uh, they weren't as determined as the NVA, they weren't determined as the VC. Uh, but uh, the, um, uh, you know, we had special forces units within the Arvin ranks and they were good. We had Rangers in there, uh, wore the old Tiger Stripe outfit, you know, they were pretty good. Uh, and uh, they worked really well with us. Uh, the regular straight line infantry though, I mean, uh, you know, they were uh, pretty questionable. Uh, they didn't really have artillery to speak of. I guess they had a little bit, uh, but uh, and some of them that were pilots did very well. They flew the a lot of them flew the old single engine World War II planes and flew close in support for some of our special op missions, and uh, uh, some of them flew helicopters. Uh, we didn't like flying with them in the helicopters because they they made them wear white helmets. <laughs> So if we saw somebody coming in with a white helmet on, we'd tell them we're waiting on the next taxi we can get down there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we respected them as people and we respected them uh, trying to help them out, trying to give them that uh, mantra of what free men are and uh, what they could be there. Uh, and so uh, from that aspect, you know, we, we gave them a lot of respect, yeah. Did you see much at all of the civilian population or were you mostly no. away from we're, we're all out in the jungle. I can count the number of times on one hand I ever saw a base camp, fire base, or, and, and if we were there, we were there for maybe 30 minutes to an hour, get resupplied and fly back out. Uh, we never were. And one of the, one of the uh, stories I was gonna tell tonight is about Joey Heatherton, that, uh, the blonde bombshell, and I, I was in love with her. And so I, was, I found out she was gonna be at uh, Camp Eagle Christmas of 1971. So I was out in the field. I was out there doing push-ups and all that. I was going to get buffed up and look pretty good and get in there and telling everybody I was going to get a date with her, all these kind of fantasy things. And uh, <laughs> uh, the day that we were supposed to come out of the field, uh, I was calling for the helicopters, you know, to get picked up. And the lieutenant called me back and said to hold our position and that we would be doing patrols in the rocket belt, which was right outside the rocket range of uh, Camp Eagle to make sure that nobody rocketed the, the show. So I never got to see Joey Heatherton. Everybody else got to enjoy her, and we uh, we stayed out in the bush and did what we did. So uh, that uh, that's kind of the deal on that. We uh, uh, did a good job, uh, and I, I uh, really felt sorry for the for the uh, people there pretty hard thing to watch. And uh, not just from the, uh, the war side, but just the fact to know that they had no hope, no matter which way it went, to make any difference. Uh, because one way or the other, they're still gonna be what they were before we ever got there. And that is people that are just totally victimized uh, by a lot of people with a lot of money. And uh, they treat them like dirt. And to, uh, they're so used to that, I think it's just ingrained in their culture and they, they uh, in some cases didn't seem to mind it. So uh, it was a hard thing to look at. And you see uh, humans that have really in their life never lived, never had. They've existed from one day to the next. Uh, some of them nowadays, you know, they oh, of course got industrialized now. You got every country in the world over there making stuff. Yeah, they became capitalists. Yeah, and they're, yeah, they're, they're capitalists. They, they uh, are doing very well and, you know, prosperous and uh, you know you still have your people back there in the remote areas that are still uh, you know in, in some squat and squalor but uh, it's nothing like what I saw and I'm gonna tell you that was uh, that was rough uh, to watch humans uh, suffering that way and and you're absolutely powerless to do anything for them so little things that you could do run a VC out of a village or run them out of a particular area or uh, keep the NVA if they captured some of the young kids and were trying to train them into uh, soldiering, you know, if you could catch up with them and maybe even get one or two of them away from them. Uh, that never happened, but we tried as hard as we could to, to do those things. And uh, pretty unfortunate that the whole thing took place, but uh, that's the way you have to do it. And the, the significance at that time was uh, stopping the domino effect from taking place. Uh, my friends in intelligence, explain that to me uh, from the very beginning, and I'm gonna explain that tonight. Uh, when you look at the map and you see Vietnam outlined in red, and you see China right above it, how big that is, and right over next to that is the so Soviet Union, 
uh, and you know the uh, the uh, the uh, moves they've made since that day, uh, invading Afghanistan and invading everywhere else, trying to spread communism and take over the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, that never goes away. And we just arrested 11 Soviet agents right here in the United States. So they can tell you the Cold War is over all they want to. It's not over with. I don't think they qualify as Soviet anymore exactly. Yes. Yeah. Still part yeah. of the Russians. I, I call them Soviets. And I, it's a, it's a mentality uh, where you, um, uh, you, you got one side that's called freedom and you got the other side that's called whatever it else it is. And in my book, freedom is about the only side that I'm going to be on. So they can bring me and call me whatever they want to or call themselves whatever they want to. I'm going to stand on the side that I'm on. That's on the side of freedom and human dignity. And if they give me any other thing on the plate, then they got to fight. And we'll fight them anywhere and everywhere. I think they got that. They understood that very well. And we whipped them soundly uh, uh, in every engagement, everything we ever did. Uh, and uh, especially in the Tet Offensive in 68, they got their rear end handed to them by the United States military. So uh, <coughs> people uh, like that and armies like that, where they're brainwashed into following, uh, they're like bullies. And the only way you deal with a bully, smack him hard every time he shows up. And so. That was my take on it, and uh, the reason why I did it, and the reason why I was uh, really proud to do it. If we had to do it again, I'd be the first one in line, and uh, if they'd let me go now, I'd, I'd be with the guys in Iraq and Afghanistan, because uh, that's what a soldier does. Right. Now, let's get back to yourself there. I mean, you get, you are, you finally leave in, in, in 73, you come back home. Uh, are you discharged pretty quickly after you get back home? Or no, I still had about, uh, I think, uh, I remember about nine or ten months left, and that was like torture. And because of uh, the assignments we had done and who we had become, we were about the farthest thing from garrison soldiers that were. Uh, we were probably more closely to mad dogs than we were anything, but uh, they, and I use the term threw, they threw us away at Fort Hood. And it was just a repository for everybody like me. Uh, our military careers were done. And they had just, uh, Nixon had started the new volunteer army. There wasn't room for us. And uh, we were from the old school, and he just didn't want that. Uh, made me mad at the time because I didn't understand what they were doing. I understand it now, but it doesn't make it any easier because I was a victim of it. But um, they, uh, they wanted to manipulate and move uh, the military, especially the army, in a different direction. And we were resistant to authority, and we were resistant to, um, I mean, there really wasn't any function for us anymore. We'd all gone too far, too long, and uh, we, uh, uh, our special skills weren't needed anymore, really. So uh, I, I couldn't understand it. They put a lot of pressure on us, made us just sit in a motor pool all day and check the oil in a armored personnel carrier for day in, day out. and. You know, we're living in these barracks now that instead of the old shotgun wood barracks with a pot-bellied stove at the end, it was these modern barracks that look just like a motel room. You know, they're very modern, air-conditioned, heated, uh, you know, even had a real indoor latrine, you know, all that kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, a mess hall that was almost like gourmet food. And you had a selection of Chinese food here and Mexican food there and, you know, tr traditional American over here. And so, uh, you know, it, it changed for the better but we couldn't get there. And so, justly or unjustly, we got left behind uh, in, in the, uh, you know, it's kind of like an old workhorse on the ranch. And you get all you can out of him, and at the end of that, you do whatever you can to uh, keep him out of the field again because he becomes a liability. So uh, that, that's literally what happened to us. And uh, I, I, uh, 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 finished it out, uh, pretty rough uh, ending though. And uh, once I got out of the military, well then the real horror started with, uh, you know, the way people treated us and... Uh, what sort of reception did you get when you got back? We didn't, other than you better keep your mouth shut. And not everybody, let anybody know you served in Vietnam because uh, people were, and still are today, that's never gone away. And I've got four clients right now that just totally resent me for ever even serving in the military, much less Vietnam. And uh, one of the, the guys had 
told one of them in a meeting, you know, he said, I don't know what they were talking about. And he said, well, you know, uh, Jim was in Vietnam, and he said, I don't want to hear about that crap. And those baby killers need to just take their due and go on home. So those old uh, cliches, the old uh, uh, beliefs are hard to die because people believe it's a fact. They've been misinformed. And uh, so uh, that was pretty bad. And so if you went to apply for a job, you didn't dare put Vietnam veteran on there, U.S. military, anything. You just put on there, you know, flipped hamburgers at J uh, Joe's Barbecue or something, but you never put, uh, never put anything on there about that, never opened your mouth about it. Uh, every time you did, you either got the hell beat out of you uh, by people that were either jealous or they just uh, didn't like the war itself or whatever. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that's the way it was. So I uh, started drinking about a fifth and a half of Jack Daniels a day, uh, chewed a day's work tobacco all day, uh, smoked about four packs of Camel non-filters a day, and I uh, was just literally on a collision course with myself. And uh, technically was homeless. I couldn't go home to my house, to my family, uh, because uh, I just wasn't me anymore. And I couldn't eat anything. Uh, the only thing I could eat was Jack in the Box tacos. <laughs> uh, everything else I threw up. So uh, I was in pretty bad shape. So I used to buy sea uh, uh, rations from Colonel Bubby's surplus there in Galveston. And I would fill my truck up full of those things and eat them. Uh, but I roam around after a while. I had to sell my truck, and then I thumbed rides here and there and uh, killed coyotes for bounty at one time and things like just odd jobs, bouncing all over Texas, different places, and uh, just not being worth a hoot to anybody for about five years. And uh, all of a sudden, I got into security work, and I kind of liked that, and uh, kind of quasi-soldiering, really, and uh, got into armored car operations, and then... Uh, Worked every phase of security you can work, executive protection, uh, everything. And I left there, went into law enforcement, stayed there 20 years, and, and uh, uh, became a uh, lead investigator in uh, uh, the old Alamo Bay incident when the Vietnamese shrimpers and the American shrimpers went to war on the, on the coast. I was one of the lead investigators in that. Worked on a federal task force for about 16 years as an uh, intelligence officer and also the um, uh, you know, regular uh, old homegrown detective. So I uh, had a lot of, a lot of varied, rate, uh, varied uh, jobs there and some unbelievable experiences that uh, were brought to me because of uh, who I was. And I got to use the experience that I thought at that time was the bad things and uh, turn those into good things. And uh, uh, as we uh, say about warriors, you know, you continue the march. So uh, that's the way I continued the march. So might not have been able to retire from the military, but in a way, I guess I've spent all my life soldier, which what I started out to do. Yeah, because one of the sort of standard questions in this kind of interview it is to ask the veteran, you know, how do they think their their time in the service affected them? But really, much of what it is that you've been saying all the way through really answers exactly that question. Yes. Uh, it, it made a, a mark on you in a variety of ways. Um, is, can you think of a sort of a particular example from your sort of professional life uh, in the past few decades where something that you learned or some quality that you acquired or developed in your time in the service wound up helping you do something maybe you couldn't otherwise? Sure. Yeah, man, I'll tell you, you know, when you, uh, uh, in uh, law enforcement, you know, we first got in there and I went to a training program and the guy's trying to teach everybody to go through the building after the bad guy with the gun and he's showing them all these dramatic moves with the flashlight and you know all this real neat stuff and I was sitting there looking at all that going what in the hell's the matter with you and so finally uh, we were on a break and he came over there to me and he says I noticed this kind of sour look on your face and I said well uh, be honest with you I don't know why you're teaching them to do that and he said, well, I'm trying to save their life. And I said, you might be taking their life. And the minute you turn that flashlight on, number one, they're going to know how many of you there are. Number two, they're going to know exactly where you are. And I don't care how you hold that tactically. Uh, all they got to do is just start spraying the air, and you're probably going to get hit. So I said, uh, that, 
that in my book's not the way to do it. And so he backed up and he said, well, all right, smart Alec, how would you do it? And I said, well, I'll show you. So we went in there and I said, put a man in the building and give him a blank. And so we had the blank and after gun, you know, we used. And so uh, he went in the building. So he said, you want to use my flashlight? And I said, I'm not going to use a flashlight. And he said, well, how are you going to find him? And I said, I'm going to sense him. And so I went in the building, came out with him in handcuffs, no shots fired. And he says, how in the hell did you do that? And I said, same way Ray Charles plays the piano without looking. You want to tell him he can't play the piano because he's blind? So we sense things. We use these too much. And that was the one thing I learned in the war, that uh, your senses are just not used. You, you're kind of a not incomplete human walking around with all these neat talents and abilities, and you just don't ever develop them or use them because, quite frankly, there's just no need. And then the, the, uh, uh, the thing that they brainwash you with growing up is you, you got to see it, but you really don't. And so I started teaching law enforcement officers all of it, just lit a fire. And I was surprised that the very guy that thought he was, you know, I was being a smart aleck, wanted to learn how to do it right then. And so uh, I showed him, and so we uh, started teaching those. Uh, it led me to my, uh, one of the most successful entrepreneurships I had, and that was designing some of the first formulas for pepper sprays uh, back in the late 1970s. And uh, I used uh, my summation of what I had seen the, uh, these, these tribal ladies use on me uh, and I figured it was probably what my grandpa used to use on himself and horses, and that was the chewing tobacco, chewed up and moist, flattened as a pancake, and doused with cayenne pepper powder, and then you pour whiskey over the top of that, and they used it for everything, and it worked. So uh, we developed on all that, came up with some really good uh, pepper uh, formulas, the 2 million Scoville heat unit, 5% uh, uh, spray in a 3-ounce canister, and it sold like hotcakes. And it was very effective. And then I designed the uh, first decontamination formula for people that have been sprayed with pepper spray because it's not water soluble. So you can run all the water on yourself you want to, it's not doing any good. So it's an oleo resin, you gotta break it down. And I went ahead in science, red, 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 look, 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 couldn't find anything. Because the problem was, you know, you can strip it with isopropyl alcohol, but you can't get that close to your mouth, your nose, or your eyes, or an open wound, or, you know, those kind of things. And uh, I happen to remember uh, an old lady when I was a young cowboy, and they had some hot sauce. And I dug into this. I got drunker than Cooter Brown, and uh, the old boys got me messed up on mezcal. And, uh, so the next day I had this hangover, so she brought out this salsa and chips. And she says, you eat, you get sober. So I started eating this stuff. And I told her, I said, I'm on fire, man. This stuff is really hot, you know, taking my breath away. So she says, okay, and she came out with a cup of coffee and a chocolate bar, and it curbed it. And I came to that about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I jumped out of bed, ran in, and my office at home is like, got dry erase boards all the way around, and I'm just like a mad hatter, and I just started writing all this stuff. And uh, all of a sudden, I began to realize that uh, peppers, coffee, and chocolate are all alkaloids. So you fight fire with fire. So I boiled all that down, and the final product was uh, I took sucrose, and I took some deionized water, and I got some Johnson's No Tears Baby Shampoo, mixed it all together. And I was, had to be the guinea pig, because it's my idea. And I let them blast me right in the face with this stuff, and it didn't work. So I was flying back from Phoenix, and I was pretty upset about that. And again, I was reading one of those little magazines, you know, like you read in flight. And I read, uh, all of a sudden, it just hit me, chemistry 101, you know, you, you have to balance the pH. So I balanced the pH, next time it worked. And so it's still on the market, still out there selling. It's called Sudicon. And uh, so that uh, those things all came directly from the war. It was a way that you uh, began to develop senses, use your mind, and realize that, you know, some of this stuff that you learned, even though you're not fighting a war anymore, uh, you can fight the war in a different way uh, by using these techniques and some tactics and things like that um, in a quasi-military role. So law enforcement, security, all that kind of stuff uh, paved the way, and I still do it today. I'm uh, starting a new phase of uh, counterterrorism and cyber warfare. So I went through a month-long school here just a few months ago, 
and learned how to be a systems administrator so you can teach old dogs new tricks. And uh, uh, did that for, uh, you know, the first time. Uh, so th th those kind of things, you know, you, you bring a lot of baggage out of a war zone like that. But at some point in time, you, you got to get your head straight and realize that uh, some of that stuff can be used, you know, kind of like a spear. You just reshape it and use it for something else. So that's uh, kind of the attitude I took and uh, really the only way you can look at it. Now you mentioned that when you got back from Vietnam, you know, you weren't going to talk to people about it or they didn't want to know it or whatever. Uh, was there a point where you decided maybe it was okay to start talking or yeah. how long have you been telling your story? 36 years I sat silent. I never told a single living soul. And uh, uh, I met Gleaves Whitney, the director of the Houndstown Center. And uh, I was sitting on the middle of a, or sitting on a horse out in the middle of a cow pasture working cattle. And him, him and his family, when his boys were little, they had come out to the ranch to visit. And so we were punching cows. And so the kids were out there. And, and uh, my little horse, Buck, that I had trained, uh, had him doing tricks. And so I saw his kids. So I always did his mouth, made him move his mouth like Mr. Ed. And then I'd do his voice. And so his kids really believed that Buck could talk. <laughs> so we became pretty good friends. And they came down uh, very regularly. Uh, to the ranch. And so we, we got to be really good, solid friends. And I, I think our first encounter was pretty uh, one of those magical deals where you feel like you've known somebody all your life and you've only spent five minutes with them. But uh, the only reason why I talked to him is because he could tell I had something bothering me, but I could tell that he had something bothering him. And so we kind of played cat and mouse. I'd tell him a little bit. He'd tell me a little bit. And his dad had been in World War II. And so he had questions about why his dad acted certain ways, you know, through his childhood and stuff. And I think I was able to answer some of those questions for him at least. And finally, I released a little bit of the story to him. And he called me or got a hold of me and uh, had me come up here in August of 2006. And I told him, no, 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 I can't do that. I'm not supposed to talk about this stuff. and. Uh, you know, all that. And so he kept prodding and prodding and prodding. And, and I talked to my dad. My dad's 90 and he's World War II Korean veteran. And I said, well, Dad, they want me to go up there and tell this story. And I'm not real sure I better do that. And he said, well, son, if you keep that secret for 36 years, you're doing better than the rest of them. And uh, I don't think anybody will care anymore. And he said, you go up there and tell the story. So I said, all right. So <clears throat> that was the first time I ever opened my mouth to anybody, and I think nobody was more shocked about that than my family because they never knew what I did. My dad knew better than to ask me any questions. And uh, so they just kind of left it alone, and uh, I guess they figured I'd come around, which I, you know, I finally did. But, uh, you know, you, you keep these things inside. Uh, I guess everybody... Uh, wants to know in one way and really don't want to know in another way because sometimes it proves their theory wrong or proves their prejudice wrong or it uh, shatters their childhood beliefs or whatever. But uh, yeah, I was 36 years and it was the greatest day I've had uh, that I can remember. And I came back in 2008, did a PTSD conference with uh, uh, Dr. Michael Ryan and Carolyn Carino. And uh, we did a three-way uh, talk and uh, Q&A afterwards, and uh, these things just became so powerful. Uh, and in my speech in 2006, there was a lady in the audience, uh, and I probably can't tell this without uh, uh, taking a second, so if you'll <coughs> kind of bear with me. But anyway, she uh, sitting out there in the middle, and as I was talking, I kept watching her in the middle of the people. And she was fiddling with envelopes. And I did not thought she was a reporter at first. And uh, so after I got through, we did a little Q&A. And her hand, I think she was third or fourth question. And she started saying something, and nobody could hear her. So I asked her to speak up, and she did. Well, it became apparent that she had heard me on the radio preceding the speech talk about this mission. And her husband was dead. She never knew what happened. Uh, 
So she brought the uh, uh, letters with her. And uh, I uh, came down off the stage, uh, gave her the, the mic that everybody could hear it. And uh, she did a beautiful job, uh, read them out loud. And her husband mentions in the letter, you'll be the first woman on your block to know that your husband is in Laos. So it made the full circle for her. She understood uh, <coughs> excuse me, where, where he was at and uh, what happened. So uh, pretty, good, uh, pretty good deal, very powerful moment. It's also a reminder of, of why it, it matters. Oh, yeah. The men who were there come and you bet. tell their stories. And it, uh, excuse me, it uh, uh, kind of reinforced to me that I if you don't tell these stories, then uh, you, you kind of don't help other people that are out there uh, that need to know. So uh, that that was the opening bar right there. That that one night just kind of lit the fuse. So I've got uh, two, two books that I've started, uh, doing the PTSD things for veterans, trying to help them with that, and uh, helping myself at the same time, so I'm not being selfish with that. Uh, and uh, got invited back up here to uh, do this speech tonight, which again, you know, it's a great honor. Be invited the first time, be invited three times, it's, that's uh, bigger than what I ever expected. And uh, so <coughs> uh, the value of that, getting the story out there, I've actually recontacted uh, uh, the only people that I knew the names of in uh, one of our operations, and I'm going to try to get back, get the whole team together on film and talk about uh, this stuff where uh, it's not my story, it's our story. That's the way I would rather tell it, because it was. And uh, <coughs> the... Uh, 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 you know, all, the, all this stuff will come out. It's important for me to know uh, that somebody 50 years from now is not going to pull out uh, some book somewhere and some author, uh, you know, starts putting his own agenda into something that we did. So uh, I appreciate projects like this where people can hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, they understand the uh, emotion and, and the compelling reasoning for why, because that's, that's the biggest question people have a problem with. Why? Why'd you do that? Why didn't you go to medical school? Why didn't you marry your childhood sweetheart? Because I didn't do any of those things. Uh, and my destiny was to be a soldier, and that's what I was, and I still am. And uh, So, you know, we, we lead on, uh, and in the process, uh, we help other people. That's what being a warrior is. So, right. that's the deal. <laughs> Thanks for one remarkable story. So thank you very much for coming and telling it to us. Appreciate yeah. That. Well, I appreciate your time, and, and uh, hopefully, like I say, it'll uh, lead somebody else to maybe find some type of answers that uh, maybe they never knew and always wondered. All right. That will be a wrap. Okay. Well, well thank you. I really didn't know that uh, you were going to invest that.